morning, everyone, and welcome back. We are in the course of fundamental Catholic principles in bioethics in the master's in bioethics at St. Thomas University. Always beginning with a little prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O Lord, send forth your spirit, and we shall be recreated. You shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right, as always, any questions or comments from previous lectures or anything in the program? Some of you have sent me hours of internship, some have not. Please bring yourself up to date on that, all right? I know that you have until December. Please. We can highlight it. Okay, let me, let me finish uh, the sentence here, sorry. Okay, so the internship. I know that you have until December, but uh, you know, 150 hours is quite a bit. Don't push it to the end because uh, then you're gonna be rushed. So please program yourselves and space them out so that we can get the work done. And specifically at the forest, uh, I always need uh, help there, right? And if you have any particular questions or comments about the internship and specifically internship at the forest, we can talk here during the break or right after the class. Okay, Kenny, about the book, I like. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, it's, well, it's, it's not the ideal highlighting like in yellow or maybe underline with pencil okay. would be better. Okay. Can you do that instead? Yeah. Underline with pencil, unless you plan on buying it, uh, so the book, again, is Meyer's um, famous book, right? It's already out of print, which is actually a blessing in disguise because now used books appear online all the time. And when I see them for four or five bucks, I buy them. And that way I have a little stack of them. So if you plan on keeping it, you can just give me five bucks at the end of the course and I'll buy, I'll replace it with another used one. Okay, so that... You can decide if you want to highlight more heavily or actually get into dialogue with the book, which is to make notes uh, on the side margins and things like that. Then I suggest that uh, you just buy it. <laughs> Otherwise, if you're planning returning it, then you can highlight, but maybe use pencil or something like that. So it's not as intense, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And by the way, that's, uh, uh, I always recommend books, physical book on hand. I know that now it's all ebooks, it's all virtual, but this virtual reality, we have to be careful, right? With the virtual reality because it's not uh, as real as a physical reality. And even in the virtual reality, we can multiply ourselves. We can be in several places at the same time and so forth. And then the extreme is this meta platform that you can, one can change one's personality and construct a fictitious character about oneself in the meta reality and then interact with other meta people who are in there. Very dangerous, be careful with that. There's a level of fun that can be done there. For example, I can put myself when I was 30 years old with black hair <laughs> instead of a bald spot. Uh, but if you go beyond the light and you start taking that seriously, it can actually mess up the brain, all right? So be careful with these platforms that offer virtual realities mm. because they can put us into a fantasy world that is, well, just pure fantasy, it has nothing to do with the real reality that we have to live in putting physical food into our mouths and actually in the pillow at night and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh yeah, so eBooks. <laughs> I'm not a fan of ebooks. Uh, sometimes administration is trying to sell us professors that the students prefer ebooks. I'm not convinced about that. I have not looked at the research on it either. I'm told that there is research that proves that uh, the current generation, the young generation, prefers ebooks than a physical book in your hand. I suspect that that is so because. Everybody is so instantaneous and fast, but a physical book, there's nothing like a physical book in, in my hand that I can flip pages back and forth and I can enter into dialogue with the book by writing on the margin and so forth. So I highly recommend to have physical books for your other courses too. And you have a right to 
uh, demand that as an alternative to the ebook, all right? It's part of the contract. <laughs> okay, that was my two cents. And the other two cents is this first slide on the PowerPoint, which by the way, I'm going to, uh, I'm updating the PowerPoint. The one that I sent you had a glitch, had um, an error, a dyslexic error. I'll point it out when I get to it, but this is the updated one. And this slide, normally this is the first course that I teach on the sequence. And so here are a bunch of abbreviations that I use when I correct and comment on your, your summaries. I know it's a little late, but they say better late than never. So it's just uh, some abbreviations that I use when I correct uh, and put comments on your uh, summaries. You probably figured them out by now. Okay, uh, anything else? Let's go forward now. So we're getting into the chapter two of uh, Meyer and uh, third lecture. And that's what they're starting to dovetail in. All right, so uh, for those who are still doing summaries, you can incorporate chapter two of Meyer into this third lecture, which is basically the evidence for evolution or the evolutionary process. Remember that what we're looking at here is to complete the picture of origins of the phylogenetic origin of the human species. Basically, when did we begin to be human? And you notice that the word human is a reference to the genus, right? Homo. So Homo is our genus, and we get the word human from there. Uh, now, the question of origins at the phylogenetic level of the whole species of humans raises also ethical questions, ethical issues, especially when we try to um, complement the narrative between science and religion, right? Uh, the evidence, the physical evidence that is in front of our eyes and our senses, which a lot of it is the fossil record, but then some other evidence uh, and that is um, listed here with the narrative in the Judeo-Christian tradition that I've been talking about, a Judeo-Christian theological anthropology, right? That's a mouthful, but it's one of those four words or three words hyphenated are symbolic. Judeo-Christian means essentially that we tap into the monotheistic tradition of um, Judaism and Christianity, essentially integrating the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. It's 72 books there, actually 73 books. So it's a whole library that spans several thousand years. I'll have more to say about that in the second half of the course, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. But then anthropology, study of the human from the theological perspective, all right? Including in and then the possibility of the existence of God. And the one que the one thing that we never questioned or that I never questioned in the entire program is the possibility of the existence of God. I take that as a given. That's a very separate subject. I can always, I'm always glad to sit with uh, students or anyone to talk about the evidence for the possibility of the existence of God. But I have to start somewhere, the platform for the program. And that's the platform that I start from that God exists as God. So if God exists as God, then he exists as creator and not creature. <laughs> Otherwise, it's no longer God. And so God as creator can create, but God even uh, maintains himself, let's say, within the laws that he has created in nature, what we call uh, natural law. Again, we'll get into natural law uh, more into the second half of the course. But that natural law is uh, a concept, a reality that we use also in the next courses of beginning of life and end of human life. So there's more to come on that. Going back then to the scientific side of the evidence that is in front of us that we can actually sense with our external senses, uh, that is real. And uh, we cannot deny that this is a marker in front of me this marker exists independently of my uh, wanting it to exist or understanding that it exists or anything like that. 
when I came into the room this morning, this marker was there, and I plan to leave it here when I leave. So any other person who comes in can pick it up and say, marker, independently, objectively, whether I understand what the marker does <laughs> or not. So the evidence from evolution, oh yes. So evolution basically is a how, all right? There are several key questions that we can always ask, not just grammatically, but they also get into uh, philosophy and even theology and science. But we can ask key questions like uh, what, why, what, how, where, and when. It's interesting that we have five fingers in each hand normally, and there are these key questions that can be asked, right? And these key questions have repercussion, have answers in various different fields of study. For example, one field of study is empirical science, like the natural sciences, the physical sciences, or they can view the pure sciences, like mathematics, for example, which is a pure science, right? Abstract by the numbers or letters. Or it could be a theological uh, discipline, the study of the possibility of God and, the, and its consequences, and so forth. So think about it. Why is um, why, uh, what, how, when, and where? All right. So when and where is about time and place. So generally, those fall into the natural and physical sciences. The when and where is about time and place. Uh, the how is about process. How is about process. For example, it can be a chemical process. It can be a physical process. It could be a climatological process like weather or climate itself, etc. And the other two, what is typically the author, the actor, the agent, for example, it could be the scientist study, it could be a theologian uh, theologizing, or it could be the philosopher philosophizing. That's that's uh, the, the who. And then there is the, the why. The why, in my mind, anyway, is kind of the biggest question to ask, right? Now, there's little why, like with lower cap, and there's big why with, big, uh, with upper cap, or even the whole word in why. Why the big question, you know, where do we come from? What is, what is our origin? Why do we exist? Why are we here? Mm -hmm. What is our purpose? So I think that why is a very big question that encompasses many others too. And it's an existential question. We each need to ask that question at some point in our lives and then start coming up with answers and the answers will take the rest of our lives <laughs> to figure out. But in the meantime, we make progress, okay? We make progress. And so that's why I uh, like Meyer and actually admire him as a scientist to get into those questions that really are metaphysical questions. When you think about it, those two words generally are mutually exclusive, even though there is really some overlap, but the physical is what can be measured, also known as empirical, that can be measured with instruments, right? Like uh, length and volume and weight and so on and so forth, or even uh, energetic states, uh, that's all physical reality can be measured. But metaphysical, the word meta uh, is beyond, typically the, the best, one of the translations is beyond, right? Is beyond or outside of the physical. So metaphysical realities also exist, but they are really beyond the physical. For example, how do we measure love or hate? <laughs> hmm? Well, these are metaphysical realities. How do we measure God or eternal life, etc.? See, and that's, again, we're tapping into the Judeo-Christian tradition, which all these realities are there, but they are metaphysical. And therefore we have to use different instruments, if you will, to measure that, which is basically reasoning. Reasoning and also aided, helped by faith. By faith, by illumination, that in the Judeo-Christian tradition, we believe comes from the spirit of God and some messengers also that he sends, which generally we call angels, and more specifically in the Christian tradition, also the community of saints that can inspire us by their way of life, etc. So we have aid, we have help, we have tools to deal with the physical and the metaphysical, but the different realms, and we have to deal with them 
in different ways, all right? We're not really into weighing love by measure of grams or kilos or tons, but we can measure the CO2 in the atmosphere by way of tons, like we did in the environmental bioethics course, because it's a gas that can be measured. So going back to the physical, the first half of the, of the course, mm, evidence for evolution, which is a how, it's a process. Whereas the creation it answers more the question of why. And it gives God the realm of being God, creator. We'll get to it. So we have at least six different lines of evidence for evolution. And this is, again, a little bit of the um, empirical evidence you see today when you read uh, scientific articles and journals. You'll see that it's a little bit of a shotgun effect. In other words, there is the evidence from various lines that are coming in, various lines that are semi-independent of each other, and they all point to a common thing, okay, to a common source. And so it's a little bit of a detective work because evolution, like Meyer makes the point, has already happened. We don't observe actual evolution occurring in itself, except maybe, maybe for the superbugs, which I'll get to eventually. But uh, for the rest, we observe the result of evolution, but not the actual process itself, because it's too minute at a single lifetime, and because evolution depends a lot on long-term, generally is a uh, long-term, right? Lots of time. Typically it's measured in geologic time, that is thousands, hundreds of thousands, and even better, millions of years. Hmm. Speaking of millions of years, by the way, I uh, detected another mistake that I had in my uh, presentation last week when, I asked you the exercise of counting to a million and then counting to a billion, and how long does it take? If we count one number, one, one number per second, just to make the math easy, the arithmetic easy, then we would count to 60 in a minute. We'll count to uh, 60 times 60, 3,600 in uh, one hour, et cetera. I had put there, I think that to count to a million would be four or five hours. It's much longer than that because I forgot to multiply that hour times 24, all right? And then divide that number into a million. So it's actually about 11 days, 11 and a half days uh, to count to 1 million, just one, one by one. 11 and a half days, day and night, continuous, no eat, no bathroom, no... Uh, sleep, no nothing, just count for 11 and a half days. The billion is over, uh, one of you got it. I don't know if the rest of you have done the math yet. I haven't seen it in your summaries, but anyway, it takes about 30, over 30 years to count to a billion, just one billion. A billion is thrown around today like nothing, you know, like drinking a glass of water. The budget is already in the trillions and the national debt is in the trillions, which is astronomical. Uh, but just to a billion, to count to one billion, one by one, would take about 30 years straight. And therefore, when we talk about the, the Earth being four and a half billion years, that's very significant. The universe being about 14 billion years, that is a huge amount of time, but it's not infinite. It's not infinite. It's a specific amount of time, which is very significant because if it's specific amount of time, then we can measure it. Okay, back to the issue of evolution as a process, as a how. We have these six lines of evidence at least, which are the major ones. And um, also record one way or another is kind of the most ancient one. They're more or less put here chronologically, but uh, the first uh, five are uh, older evidence, more classic, if you will. And the more recent one is at the molecular level, essentially the percentage homology, percentage of homology of DNA between different species, the genome, or protein, which is the expression of the genome, the, what is known as the proteonome, the proteonome, which is the deciphering of the thousands, probably maybe millions of proteins that we have 
in our bodies and in nature generally. Let's move forward then for each one. I have a few slides of each one of these. So most of you are kind of familiar because you all have, uh, this cohort happens to have all scientific background one way or another. Fossil record. The animals, you've seen these in movies, you've seen them in museums, you see them all over the place. Uh, it typically is a skeleton and uh, um, the bone actually becomes mineralized for those who are endoskeleton, mostly the vertebrates, fish, amphibian, reptiles, birds, and mammals, the five classes of um, five uh, classes of uh, vertebrates. And the bone itself becomes mineralized, mineralized from the minerals around the bone locally where the bones fell. Sometimes we find entire skeletons, sometimes we find just fragments of bones. Okay? And those are for the um, internal skeletons, but also external skeleton like this uh, trilobite, mm -hmm. for example, you can see this is one centimeter. So this trilobite is maybe about anywhere between five to 10 centimeters, probably about seven or eight centimeters. Okay, um, about three or four inches for scale. They have exoskeleton like crabs, lobsters, um, all the insects, butterflies, uh, grasshoppers, anything that crunches <laughs> when you crunch it, when you crush it, uh, those are exoskeletons. Those can also be somewhat mineralized. It's um, protein, generally uh, it's the, uh, it's a carotene protein similar to our nails, fingernails and hairs but it can also be somewhat mineralized and we have the fossil record. Or it can also be a print or it can also be embedded in amber. Amber is resin typically from uh, pine trees, from conifers. And some insects have become embedded in that resin and then preserved. The resin itself becomes crystallized and it could be millions of years old. And those are also fossils. That's the whole insect there. Remember the Jurassic Park series? The scientist was going after what? Was going after Mosquito. the mosquitoes in the abdomen. The theory was that they had blood from dinosaurs, assuming that the dinosaurs were reptiles, which is controversial. Then our mammal blood, mammalian blood is enucleated. In other words, adult mammals, we ditch out our RBCs or red blood cells, we ditch out the nucleus. So if it's enucleated, there's no DNA, there's no nuclear DNA in our RBCs, right? But that's for mammals. It turns out that birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, their RBCs are still nucleated. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, when I was doing my PhD in genetics at Purdue, uh, I was working with DNA, structure and function of DNA, and we would use chicken blood. <laughs> there's a lot of chicken blood available for research, right? Because of uh, a lot of chicken are being killed for food and therefore uh, chicken blood is also sold to labs and we would purify chicken blood. Which we would centrifuge out the RBCs and then purify, uh, lyse the cells and obtain the DNA from the nucleus. So that was an abundant source of uh, DNA, vertebrate DNA. It's avian, it's not mammal, but it's uh, avian DNA, which served the purpose of the research we were doing. So the idea was to obtain that DNA from uh, reptiles, assuming the mosquito was biting reptiles and so forth, and then uh, they would recreate the reptile, the, uh, the dinosaur from the DNA sequence. That also assumes that that DNA was an intact <laughs> genome, which is highly unlikely because if it's in the abdomen of the insect, what do you think has happened to that RBC and to the rest of that blood that the insect sucked? It was digested, right? <laughs> it's just like when we eat a piece of meat or we eat, uh, well, chicken meat, chicken meat, we're eating their DNA also, right? But that gets uh, all digested into the stomach. Uh, in the intestines. So uh, there's science fiction in the movies, what I'm trying to say. It's a nice theory, but it's, it's mostly science fiction. Anyway, 
So that's also considered a fossil, right? It also happens in plants, it's not only animals. Mm -hmm. You can see this trunk here, it pretty much looks like a, a fossil. What kind of plant do you think this is? This kind of a trunk. That's these jagged uh, structures. If you picture a palm tree, you cut off the front of a palm, you basically get this kind of structure. Okay, so that could be a very primitive plant, which primitive palm, which were abundant. There is a fossil evidence of palms. Sometimes the actual front gets embedded in sediment. And so you can see here, not only this, this is a, uh, a leaf, probably of a flowering plant, similar to, for example, there's a plant called elephant ear that exists today. It looks very similar to this, but this goes back millions of years. And then don't, don't miss the other leaves that are around here. Now, leaves themselves are not gonna last millions of years in sediment. The organic material, which is mostly cellulose, right, of the leaf, that's gonna get degraded and broken down. But the imprint, the imprint of the sediment, the pattern was preserved. And so that pattern, that imprint is also considered a fossil, similar to the mud where the dinosaurs walked or the humans walked and left an imprint. That is the famous fossil of Lucy. I don't know if you've heard about Lucy. Uh, she is an Australopithecine, in other words, a southern monkey that is uh, related to us. Uh, Lucy fossil. And uh, she left an, also an imprint by petal. Oh, give me the, these are all reconstructions from the skeleton that is partial, fragmented, and so forth, but reconstructed by computer uh, tomography, very sophisticated. Uh, uh, programs, but I wanted to see uh, prints mm. because these fossils, it's actually, it's actually a whole family that was found. There was also a little child found next to her walking here. This one. You see the prints? Definitely bipedal, alternating from left to right foot, right? And uh, this is some kind of animal that walks across there, uh, probably a hoofed animal, different. But there are other prints where there's Lucie and another little child walking next to her. Mm -hmm. So the print is, oh, here we go. Uh, this, no. Anyway, this is the most famous one, as you can see. Oh, here, here we go. See, actually, this is the footprint of the adult, and this is the footprint of the child. Mm -hmm. Smaller, but you see the gait, trying to keep up, so the, you can tell a lot from this. See, these two footprints are closer to each other. These are further away. So who is walking normal here? The adult, the adult is walking normal. It's a normal gait, it's called a gait, right? Between steps. And the child had to stretch to keep up with the adult. <laughs> Come on, hurry up, hurry up. The tiger is behind us. <laughs> okay, so you can see the print. My point about this is that the print is also considered a fossil. So we have basically the three sources of fossils, the actual skeleton mineralized or the sediment print left or the amber uh, creature that got trapped into uh, resin, mostly of. Mm. Uh, conifers. Going forward. Now, chronology, how do we date these fossils? How do we give them a date in time? Ancient, which is typically going to be in the hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions of years, right? Well, we do it by strata, what is known as geologic strata. One stratum, several strata. And so sediment layers which typically are from rivers overflowing or mud coming through a region or simply just gravel or dirt accumulating, right? But it forms layers, horizontal layers, and whatever died there gets buried under the layers. 
So the normal expectation is that the deeper we go through layers, the older the fossil in general, as long as the layers have not been disturbed, all right? You can see, for example, here a fault line that these layers have been somewhat disturbed, but they can be slight disturbation or they can be drastic perturbation where the layers actually reverse each other with something called upwelling or uplifting and they flip. So we have to be very careful when we look at geologic uh, strata to layer them correctly and to date them uh, chronologically in the right way. We would expect also, as we go deeper into the layers of sediment, that the more recent fossils are gonna be in the upper layers and the more primitive fossils, the more primitive species will be in the lower layers. Remember in the background this paucity of the fossil record, right? Keep in mind this paucity of the fossil record, meaning the scant amount of fossils available. We find one, two, three, a dozen skeletons is a huge find. Most of the time it's just a few fragments, not even the whole skeleton, very seldom is an entire skeleton found. Just making my usual uh, canvas here, paucity. is a uh, is, uh, few fossils, few pieces, also pieces, All right? Uh, let me see, can I just magnify this? Yeah. But it's too low. <laughs> so away, yeah. Please minimize this. All right, so we have this, uh, the layering of the fossil record by, by strata, by time, but we're still with the question. So with this so far, we can put which fossil is younger, which fossil is older. Again, in the range of thousands to millions of years tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, right? Actually all the way back to into the billions. But how do we get to the actual date, to the actual time? We have to introduce now um, the, um, the half-life of elements that we'll get to in a minute. But before there, uh, I caution you about looking at the layers because generally they don't present themselves very easily. They will be, for example, this is a nice, clean uh, uh, stratification of the wall. It's even next to a road. I've seen this in Colorado, actually, on some roads, you can get off the road and look for fossils right there on the side of the road in the, in the layers, in the strata. And you can see that this lower layer here, very dramatic, distinct, uh, layer from the upper here. This the upper layer is more brownish, probably sediment of mud and silt and soil and sand, whereas the lower layer here seems to be imbued with petroleum or coal or some kind of organic compound, right? That makes it uh, black and still stratified. So uh, this is just a a joy, a pure. Uh, heaven for geologists and for uh, scientists who are anthropologists who are looking for fossils. Okay. But look at this one, how it's jagged. This is just movement of the crust with the plate tectonics that we talked about and continental drift and all that. In fact, the, 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 the huge earthquake, the fatal lethal earthquake that just happened in Turkey and in Syria, the count of victims is about 24,000 already. It's just unimaginable, the, the magnitude of tragedy that that caused in a few minutes, just in a few minutes of one of the lateral veins coming out from a tectonic plate, from a um, an actual plate that was two plates rubbing. And the um, side effect of that 
is that tremor when when pressure builds up, eventually the crust gives and cracks and uh, shifts. Uh, look at this stratification, how it was pushed up and down again, All right? Uh, this one was nice and horizontal, the thin yellow lines, which they had made the lines a different color. <laughs> Let me see if I can grab it, no, I can't grab it. But the thin yellow lines uh, represent, oops, uh, a minute, strata, but look at what happened to the strata here. Sorry. There we go. The strata got cut through with a river that seems to be dry now, but a river just went through there and created this canyon. Well, then this is another geologist and archaeologist heaven and anthropologist heaven going through these layers because normally it would look like this and they would have to dig through that whole rocky hill, whereas as the river went through, it got through. But of course, we understand that the water of the river also took out a bunch of fossils probably and dumped them into this lake here, which by the way is showing another stratum here in, in red. But anyway, these features are sought after by uh, anthropologists and archaeologists looking for the fossils. Now, let's get into the dating thing, which is done, like I mentioned, with the half-life of uh, elements. There's a periodic table of the elements on the side wall there. Each element has a specific number of electrons and protons, which establishes their position on the table. And then in addition to protons, which are in the nucleus of the atom, there are these uh, neutrons, which are also subatomic particles. They have mass, but they don't have a charge, right? But we say they have a neutral charge, which means that uh, they're more loosely connected to the nucleus. And in fact, we talked about the weak force at the atomic level which is holding the isotopes together. Isotopes are the element, the same element with different number of neutrons, all right? I gave the example of uh, hydrogen, kind of the simplest one because it has one proton, but it can have one, two, or three neutrons. And the normal hydrogen has one neutron in addition to the proton, but then there's something called deuterium, deuterium, which has two neutrons and uh, DEU is associated with uh, two. And then there's tritium, TRI, tritium, which has three neutrons uh, and it's radioactive. And that's typically what is used for the hydrogen bomb. So remember the mass energy equivalence, E equal MC square, well, M is the mass and E is the energy. So again, that is a very graphic uh, visualization, if you will, of a little mass has a lot of energy. So even the hydrogen atom, as small as it is, has an immense amount of energy accumulated in it, in, mostly in the nucleus. Mm. So these radioactive uh, isotopes tend to decay. They decay. In other words, the higher number of neutrons tend to fall off or fly out of the nucleus, going down to the more stable isotope, which typically is an equal number of neutrons and protons, right? So tritium will decay into deuterium and deuterium will decay into normal hydrogen, one to one, proton and neutron, and then that's stable. And the vast majority of hydrogen that we have in the atmosphere is stable at hydrogen because we don't see it exploding, we don't see it uh, glowing, radioactive, etc. Every element, this, this course can be done for every element according to the number of neutrons they have. So the more radioactive ones will decay into the lesser ones. And the typical slope, the rate of decay seems to be the same, seems to be uniform regardless of the elements, whether it's a very tiny element like hydrogen or a huge element like uranium, which has 200 and the number 235 okay, on the atomic table, on the periodic table. 
the decay essentially describes a parabola because it is what is known as the half-life. Have you ever done that mental experiment of trying to get from where we are to the door in half distances, half distances. For example, I will travel to the door and I will travel half distance every time. So the first time I travel from here to the door, I will travel half the way, which will be somewhere over there, okay? Where that chair, that desk is, that's the first travel. Then the second travel, I will travel again half of that distance, which will be getting closer to the door, but halfway again, still have, we can measure that physical distance, right? Then I will travel half again, and half again, and half again. And the question is, do I ever actually get to the door itself? If I'm always cutting the distance in half, how many of you say I get to the door eventually? Or not get to the door? or not sure, that's an option, there are four options, not sure, and don't care, <laughs> that's the fourth option. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's an arithmetic, it's an arithmetic problem, really. Let's look at it for a moment. I'm doing half every time, right? So what's the first half? That's the first half, right? Then I'm gonna do half again. Oh, that's what I'm trying to do. Okay, so the next half of half is what? Exactly. And the next one, what's one half of one quarter? One eighth. Now we're getting a pattern. What do you see on the numerator? Is the same number, right? It's the distance, the one, the distance, but exactly. Now you see a pattern. The numerator stays the same, but the denominator is doubling. How do we half a distance? How do we half a number by doubling the numerator, the denominator? By doubling, so you see? And that's how, so if we keep doubling the denominator, you know, it's, it's uh, a to the, to the two, right? And therefore, how many times can we double the denominator? Give me any number and I can give you the, no, the double of that number. The largest number you can think of, I can always give you the double of that number. <laughs> okay? And therefore, mathematically, we never really get to the door. The problem is that I cannot measure that distance. You know, at some point my shoe is gonna touch the door because I just can't, I don't have a ruler that's small enough to measure the, the pico, the, the millions and billions and trillions of distance of getting to the door itself. Can't measure it, all right? But mathematically, I can see that I will never get to the door. <laughs> when we plot that distance, when we plot this, these points on a curve, it's going to look like a parabola. And a parabola is an approximation to x, but will never actually reach x. They will meet what we say is an infinity, all right? It's a mathematical thing. But the important thing about here is actually the first one, the first half. Because since it describes a parabola, then that parabola has a formula, a to the x, okay? Or a to the two, in this case, because we're looking at half. And the isotopic decay obeys this mathematical formula or whatever atom. We can measure that, that time, but it is specific to different elements. So different elements decay at a different rate, but the rate is always a parabola. What does this mean existentially? It means that if I start with one pound of uh, any substance, let's, um, here is a table of half-lives. You can see they go from very tiny, fraction of a second, to millions of years. And generally, you can see that 
the atopic number or what is called the nuclide is you can think of this kind of isotopes, right? Is increased generally is increasing in number generally. So let's take lithium for example, which is which element? You got hydrogen, helium, and then you got lithium. So lithium is the third element, three protons. Normal lithium has uh, three neutrons also, but you can have more and they decay in 0.8 seconds. So in less than one second, the half-life is less than one second, which would be here, all right? What does it mean? If we start with 10 pounds or 10 grams, okay, let's take it to the scale. You see the G, lowercase g, is that large enough? Lowercase g is a unit of measure in the decimal system, in the metric system, which is gram, right? It's a unit of mass. It's very tiny because the gram is very little. A kilogram is a thousand grams. Just to wrap around how much is a gram by weight, by mass, how many pounds is a kilo? How many pounds fit into a kilo? Which is bigger, the pound or the kilo? Yeah. Kilo is larger by about two times because two pounds fit into a kilo, approximately 2.2 .2 pounds. 2.2 .2 pounds is one kilo. So uh, the pound is about half of a kilo, right? So one kilo, two pounds is how many grams? The prefix kilo is a Greek reference to a thousand, right? So a thousand grams in a kilo, 500 grams in a pound, <laughs> 500. So a gram is a relatively small amount. I say this because in the lab, sometimes they have, the student has to measure a few grams and they put a whole bunch and they put too much. <laughs> Never put it back into the stock jar because they can contaminate the stock. All right, so a gram is a small amount. We start out with 10 grams of lithium. How long will it take for those 10 grams to decay into five grams. First of all, how do we get from 10 grams to five grams of lithium? What has the lithium lost? Because it's still lithium. If it's still lithium, it has to maintain how many protons? It's the third element, right? Therefore, three protons, the electrons, the orbits. So if it's still lithium, it has to maintain three protons. But what has it lost? to go from 10 to five grams. He has lost another subatomic particle that has mass, that weighs, but has no charge. The neutrons. So lithium has lost neutrons to go from 10 to five pounds. It takes time to do that. It could be grams, it could be pounds, it could be kilos, as long as we stay with the same units. <laughs> the time that it takes is the same. And for lithium to do that, it takes how long? It takes less than one minute. It takes less than one second. It takes 0.8 seconds, 0.9 seconds if we round it up. No, 0.8, 0.8 seconds, right? Because you see the atomic number is three, as can you see here, but it's got all these isotopes up to eight. Lithium eight is the most isotopic, is the most heavy lithium, if you will, is the more radioactive lithium. And so it's the least stable. It's the most unstable. That's the whole thing about radioactivity, that it is unstable. It flies out these neutrons that can affect life around it, <laughs> right? Can cause mutations in the DNA of the life around them. So when the lithium loses its neutrons, it becomes lighter. And it, it takes lithium only 0.8 seconds to do that, to stabilize. That's the half-life. Different elements take different amount of time to get to the half amount. How long will it take lithium to go from five grams to 2.5 grams? You see it's another half-life because 2.5 fits twice into five, right? So how long will it take lithium to go from five to 2.5 grams? 0.8 seconds. And half of 2.5 is 
of whatever unit, another 0.8 seconds. But you see, it's a decay that is parabolic, right? It's parabolic, but it's a fixed amount of time. And that is true for every element. And so that's precious because then we can come up with a table depending on what we want to measure these elements, what's the what's the presupposition here that these elements are inside the puzzle, or at least on the strata of the sediments, so we can date the sediment. That we find an amount of these elements embedded either into the fossil itself or into the strata, the geologic strata that we're trying to date. Yeah, elements, I guess, that you're sticking to only these. Well, this is a range. No, this is just a sample. Some, some radioactive nucleotides, okay, uh, nu nucleides, but this is just a sample of the most common ones. Actually, in the natural sciences, in fossils, the most common one is carbon, because carbon is in the fossil itself, being an organic, uh, it's, remember, organic compounds, that's why I covered organic compounds, they need to have two elements, at least, which are, Carbon and it's so common, it, it coats, it stabilizes the molecules generally all around it when there's a loose arm sticking around. Hydrogen, single element will attach, single atom, and will stabilize the molecules, right? So you can think of carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. They have a lot of carbon, they have a lot of hydrogen. So carbon is there, but is in normal carbon, what's the normal, what's the atomic number for carbon? What's the element? C, capital C, is six, right? So the uh, total number of, uh, so what's the number of protons in carbon to make it carbon? If the atomic number is six, Six protons, six protons, right? Yeah. If I take one proton out of carbon, what do I make it? Yes. B, boron, <laughs> boron. <laughs> and if I put another proton into carbon, I make it nitrogen, different element altogether, different chemical properties, different physical properties. It's amazing just by adding or subtracting protons. That's why the strong force is so important because the strong force keeps protons which are all positively charged together. It's amazing. It's an amazing group. There is the energy. There is the E equal MC squared, <laughs> all right? And holding those protons together. It's bewildering that everything around us is made out of atoms and nothing is exploding. <laughs> it's all very stable. Now, the normal number of, um, so what would be the normal number of neutrons in carbon? If the protons are six, the neutrons are six. That's the most common one, right? And that makes that carbon, we call that carbon, carbon 12, which is the most carbon. The most common carbon is stable, it doesn't explode, it's not reactive, it's not radioactive. It's a stable isotope, meaning it's the most stable isotope. Number of neutrons equal to the number of protons. So we say that's carbon 12. But then there are other isotopes carbon 13, carbon 14, 15, 16, et cetera, all right? And one that we focus on is this carbon 14. So how many protons does carbon 14 have? If it's carbon, it's gotta have six protons because it's the element number six. But how many neutrons does carbon 14 have? No, because six plus 14 would make it 20. Eight, exactly. So this number, this isotopic number, we have to subtract the number of protons to get the number of neutrons, okay? But it's got eight neutrons, which has two extra neutrons to the normal, and that is radioactive. Radioactive, it just means that it's not as stable as the stable isotope, which is normally the one uh, same number of protons and neutrons. All right, so carbon-14 is radioactive. Then we can measure the half-life because we can take carbon-14 
10 grams of carbon-14, which is not a large amount, right? 10 grams, exactly 10.0. Look, it's, that is to one decimal of, of uh, precision, right? 10.0 grams. And when it gets to 5.0, actually, uh, this number, I'm staying on the number for now. This number is accurate to how many decimals? The five, 5.00, 0, right? The fact that the zeros are there to the right of the decimal point is significant, is scientifically significant because it means that it's accurate to centesimals, to decimal and centesimal. It means that the way that we're using, the instrument that we're using to measure that has to be accurate at least to the centesimal. Most of the ways up in our lab can do that. And 2.50 also, see, we needed centesimals to get to the fourth decay because the fourth decay is 1.25. That's a centesimal, the five, right? So there's a little glitch here that um, is troubling. If this were scientifically accurate, if I send the paper in with this kind of data, it would be rejected with a comment. And what's the comment? You notice that five, is down to the centesimal in accuracy, 2.5 to 1.25. What are you talking about the 10? The way is illustrated here, the way it's written. It's only accurate to one decimal, not a centesimal. In other words, it's missing another zero here, okay? To make it really, really scientifically accurate, this should have another zero to the centesimal to match the scale. And I just spotted another one. And so I was looking at this stuff. These are all whole numbers, so that's fine, right? But what are you telling me about the y-axis? 100 is a whole number, 50 is a whole number, 25 is a whole number, but 12.5 got a decimal. So what does this 25 should have? 0 0.0, 0, 0. <laughs> And then I would not be embarrassed by being rejected for some stupidity, <laughs> okay? But that's, that's science. Anyway, you see the scale here, but oh, so we use carbon-14 because there's a small amount of carbon-14 in nature. It's radioactive, but it's not too damaging because look at how long it takes to decay for half of those neutrons to fly out, it's almost 6,000 years. So the half-life, we can say the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. That's pretty accurate, okay? 6,000 is an approximation. It's a gross approximation. But and we can measure, we can estimate that because let's say, how do we estimate that? Well, let's say we find a fossil. And we take out a uh, we we take out a few grams, which is a small amount of a fossil, the actual mineralized bone, right? Or we could do it from the strata that is around it in the sediment. And from that amount, we uh, isolate I out the percentage, or we estimate the percentage of carbon fourteen. We can measure it with a Geiger counter, for example, and measure the amount of radioactivity and so forth. We can measure the amount of carbon-14 in the sample. And then we can also weigh it. And by weighing that amount, we can tell its age because that fossil, that amount of carbon-14 was twice its weight almost 6,000 years ago and was four times its weight almost 10,000 years ago. And we can go backwards that way. Okay. So we can estimate the layers of sediment by looking at the isotopes that are embedded in those layers, either in the fossil or in the actual sediment around the fossil to date the strata. So that's what's used and it's called carbon dating. Carbon dating is the one that's used most common for especially fossils because of the amount of actual carbon in it. 
and it's only going to be a small percentage. Carbon-14 is going to be a small percentage of the total carbon there because most of the carbon in the fossil is what kind of carbon? Carbon-12, right? Which is the most stable one. Okay, so anyway, just to know then, it's a little level of detail of how the strata are dated to figure out with the plus or minus error, maybe a few thousand years of error. But what's important even is the relative uh, age of each stratum. So that, that also the relative age tells us whether the, the strata have been inverted or not, right? So if we found, for example, on this diagram here, uh, a stratum that is young and that is older, let's say that we measure this fossil here, this fossil comes out, this stratum comes out older than the layer below it or two layers below. Then it means that there was some kind of flipping here of the layers where we're measuring and it's going to give us the wrong information. So that helps us also to determine whether the layers have flipped or not, or have shifted or not, or they are truly in chronological sequence. Okay, I think that's enough detail. You can see how we can date the layers to put an approximate date for the fossil that we find in that stratum itself. Let's move forward now. And now what we want to do is we want to construct these cladograms. Hmm? Remember how uh, early on Meyer mentions uh, anagenesis and cladogenesis. Cladogenesis is the origin of entire species of entire groups. Hmm? And so these are cladograms. It's a branching diagram. It's also, this is the tree of life or the tree of evolution and so forth. What do we see here? It's a simplified representation of a main line with branching off. It's just a convenient way of representing it graphically, but it also tells us when we see something like this uh, of these animals, which are which have the oldest ancestors of all of these animals. You see that these are all vertebrates, right? Fish, amphibian, mammals, reptiles, birds. So in this diagram, which are the oldest groups of uh, vertebrates that have the oldest ancestors? The sharks. And in fact, the sharks have a cartilaginous skeleton. They're, they're all vertebrates, meaning that they all have internal skeleton, right? The fish, the amphibian, the reptiles, the birds, mammals. But um, in contrast with all the other vertebrates, sharks and rays, manta rays, have an internal skeleton of cartilage. In other words, the, the cartilage has not been classified to become bone. And that's why it's very rare to find, you almost don't find uh, shark skeletons fossilized. What you find is their teeth, which are classified. <laughs> but the skeleton is cartilage, and therefore, because it's not been mineralized, it's not been classified to be bone, then it decomposes and it doesn't last, right? It's like when we find the cranium of a human, there are two pieces of cartilage that are missing. The earlobes, that's cartilage, and the tabique nasal, the, uh, the nose tip, that's also cartilage, that's where we can bend it. You notice that the typical cranium skulls of humans and other mammals, they're missing the tip of the nose, right? The cartilage, because that decays away. All right, then we have uh, ray fin fish, which are uh, more recent in evolution, amphibians. Uh, and you notice when they're put into the cladogram, there are significant steps that have happened from one common ancestor to the other. A common ancestor is when the two lines meet. It's also called a node, N-O-D-E. So for example, Crocodilians are supposed to have evolved before dinosaurs and birds. So that puts them back before 
60 or 70 million years ago, right? Which was the age of the dinosaurs. So the node is when they had a common ancestors. If we go back 100 or 200 million years ago, we find a common ancestor to the crocodiles, to the dinosaurs and birds. Hmm? That's common, common ancestor. That means that that common ancestor was neither a crocodile, nor a dinosaur, nor a bird. It was the ancestor of those groups. And that's at the nodes. So at each node, we find common ancestors of the branching groups. The same argument between primates and rodents and rabbits. What's another rodent that's not a rabbit? Roy, it, 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 it uh, chews away. Mice, rats, right? <laughs> so they're mammals. Primates are mammals also. There was a common ancestor here that was neither a primate nor a rodent, but there was a common ancestor. When we go further back into the main branching, the main trunk, if you will, we could call this the main trunk, we see major events happening. So let's take it all the way back. This is showing all the vertebrates. The first thing that happened here was to develop vertebrae. Now vertebrae is not just a spinal column, but it's a segmented spinal column. And what do we call each segment? A vertebra, right? So it's articulated. It gives the best of both worlds. It gives support and at the same time, flexibility, bending. So when we take a, a cord, a notal cord, and we segment it into vertebrae, we get the support of the cord, and at the same time, we get the flexibility of the articulations. And that generated the five main groups of vertebrates that we have today. Again, fish, amphibian, reptiles, birds, and mammals, right? All these five groups of animals, we all have vertebrae. Then moving forward, here's a bony skeleton that generated what is known as ray fin fish, leaves the sharks behind. The sharks evolve before the bone, the, the skeleton of fish began to mineralize, began to become bony. Did it break? Then the next big event was developing limbs or arms and legs, arms and legs, four of them in pairs, two and two because of bilateral symmetry. That's another, we can look at bilateral symmetries way back here because there are other animals that are not vertebrates and are bilateral, okay? They're typically like worms, for example, and so forth, they're gonna be primitive animals, but they're bilateral. So that bilaterality developed very early on, much earlier than these groups. So developing four arms and legs, we get the amphibians. In fact, the amphibian is a very, very nice model because to, even today, contemporary amphibians, what's the, the adult amphibian is typically what? What or what, what? What are the adult amphibians? Two large groups, frogs or toads, right? Frogs or toads, those are adult amphibians. But the juvenile, as the egg hatches, is a what? The tadpole. All tadpoles into, turn into their frogs or toads. The tadpole necessarily needs to live in water and no legs yet. Eventually, the little legs come out and then the arms come out, right? And it's still got a tail that is going to generate. And you'll notice tadpoles actually have gills. And so they can breathe in the water all the time. But toads and frogs have lungs which cannot breathe totally inside the water, right? So uh, the gills are reabsorbed into the body, the tail is reabsorbed, the legs come out, and you get the frog or the toad from the tadpole. So it's a very nice example of uh, the transition there from aquatic to terrestrial. Going forward, the amniotic sac is a little sophisticated, but especially hair will bring us the mammals. And then even, um, Further on, uh, this has to do with the formation of the ice somehow. The reptiles 
and birds. So it's interesting, according to his diagram, reptiles and birds develop after the break with mammals. Okay. So at the node, there will be common ancestors for each one of these groups, major events along the main trunk, and sometimes also laterally when we have further branching. Speaking of common ancestors, here's an actual, where's the fossil record? Well, paucity of fossil record, okay? But within the paucity of fossil record, it's amazing that some of these things have actually survived because we're talking about, look at this, 150 million years ago, right? This is a famous Archaeopteryx. Ever heard of Archaeopteryx? Mm -hmm. Mm, sometimes referred to as a flying lizard or something like that, flying reptile. Archaeo is a reference to ancient. Mm -hmm. Pteryx is a reference to winged or flying. There is the actual fossil skeleton, pretty intact. Quite a few of these have been found around, some fragmented, some intact. You can see that even the pattern of the wings, which is mostly keratin protein, Right? You can think of a wing as a very sophisticated hair. And you can think of a hair as an extended scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the same substance, keratin protein, which is also similar to nail. You can see the pattern of the wings there. But when was the last time you saw a bird with fingers? We don't see it in birds. We see it in mammals. We see it in the bat, but that's a mammal. This guy's a bird, he's got feathers, okay? When was the last time you saw a bird with teeth? Doesn't happen. But in the reptiles, you have the four limbs, right? And uh, the teeth formation. So this is a reconstruction of the skeleton of the Archaeopteryx. So this is one of those common ancestors, one of those nodes of the branching is neither a full reptile, because it's got wings, it's neither a full bird, but it's a branching. It's a node at the branching of reptiles and birds. Another example of evolution within the mammals, this one also is a pretty classical one because of the relatively large number of fossils that have been found relatively from the original horse, which was called an Eohippus, Eohippus, uh, which then the name was actualized now to the Hiracotherium. Hiracotherium is now the, the new name of the Eohippus, basically. But that's the size of the original horse. And this is a modern horse, just to put it in, in perspective. Mm, so it was, the original horse-like creature was really the size of a, a dog, a medium to large size dog, right? That's about 45 million years ago. And there has been skeletons found and fragmented uh, pieces of skeletons of the various stages, the various um, stages of evolution of the primitive horse to get to the contemporary horse, which is actually shown here in gray in the background, the size. Mm -hmm. This is a horse-like uh, creature that occurs, uh, I think in Africa, maybe the East. Uh, contemporary, there are several species or subspecies like the zebra, for example, is obviously related to the horse, right? The donkey is also related and so forth. But the original one was a little guy. And that little guy actually had four toes, four toes. Mm -hmm. And started uh, losing toes because the structure that is not used a lot gets lost. Uh, for some evolutionary reason, which I'm not totally uh, clear on, maybe for running faster, getting away from the prey because these are vegetarian, right? Um, the side toe started degenerating. And so just the middle toe, or the middle finger, is the one that stayed and actually became thicker and thicker and thicker 
to the point that all the other toes degenerated out. And now all horses and donkeys and um, zebras, all these uh, horse-like uh, animals, they're actually walking on a single toe. And in fact, it's not even the toe, it's the nail of the toe, what we call the hoof. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, adaptation, that's an extreme adaptation. The hoof is actually the nail has become so thick, but it's just pure protein. Okay. That's why they have to be shaved periodically and they put the, uh, what they call that, radura in English, the horseshoe. Mm -hmm. To kind of strengthen that nail because otherwise it can crack uh, with asphalt and so it's used to being on grass and not on asphalt. Anyway, that's the evolution of the horse. It's been mapped fairly precisely, you can see, it goes all the way back to about 55 million years ago. Mm -hmm. There are skeletons or reconstructions of skulls as it gets larger, etc. Now, we can, uh, from these fossils, we can also make a cladogram of all, these are all different species of equus, you see the Equus is uh, abbreviated by the large E. These are all equi genus, same genus, all different species. Okay. Different species. There's the Equus cavallus, the cavallo horse, <laughs> as we know it today. All these others are wild. The other one that we've kind of domesticated is the cavallus and the asinus, otherwise known as donkey or ass. All right, that's where it comes from. So this is the genus. Just at the level of genus. We have living today two, four, six, eight, ten different species. Look at the nod. The nodes are represented by numbers. There are eight nodes. Okay. And but two major lines. Actually, there's a ninth node that was not numbered. Can anyone find a node that was not numbered? Now they're Another mistake in the diagram. Look at the first node, the very first node. How about this guy? Isn't this a node? There has to be a common ancestor there. So there's a mistake in that. that should, this should be one. And this should be nine. <laughs> Another mistake. I don't know why they forgot to label this. Okay. So that's actually the first node, which is an ancestor to all the the uh, equines who, that are living today mm -hmm. in 55 million years. And so all this branching off, one main line stayed to just these two horse-like uh, creatures, which are actually this Prevalsky is here, just right in this diagram, that's the Prevalsky, Equus Prevalsky, and the Equus Cavallus, is just a shade in the background here. But the other equi are further branching. I don't want to belabor this point too much, but uh, you can see that where this other branching developed, much more branching on this upper half of the diagram, probably more variety of ecosystems, right? That were selecting out these different species allowed for more branching, whereas this one stayed in some kind of a stable ecosystem and did not, did not have as much selective pressure. In other words, if we cluster these, the upper branch and the lower branch, we can intuit that the upper branch had more selective pressure on it over time because it allowed for more branching. Whereas this other one probably was in a more stable ecosystem, was not as much selective pressure. Maybe, again, just thinking out loud, probably the predator was not as prevalent here. There may have been more predators in this other region. Anyway, we can try to come to some conclusions according to that, because then we can also match this area, the geographical area, to the predators that also live there. In other words, carnivores, right? What would be the predator of a zebra? Today, a lion. Zebra herbivore has to be where the grass is. Lion has to be where the zebra is or any other mammal that they can catch. But 
we can find fossils of zebra. We can also find fossils of zebra ancestors. We can also find fossils of lion ancestors, feline ancestors, right? So we can do a similar diagram, for example, with the uh, Felidae, Felix, the, the genus uh, Felix, and branch it out, Felix Pantera, Felix Tigris, Felix Leo, etc. Do the branching and then look at the geography and how, see, superimpose them and see how they match. And we can start deducing what was the selective pressure that led to this branching off on the upper half and no branching on the lower half until recently. Hmm? Anyway, that's how cladograms are studied and used. Eventually, we come up with something like this, which is the classification of the species according to Linnaeus. Again, the paradigm that has lasted for about 300 years, really interesting. And it looks like it's gonna be here to stay for, for quite some time. Mm. Oh yes, this is the glitch that, uh, this is another mistake that I had made. Sometimes I'm dyslexic, I'm less standard and I do things backwards, right? I'm also running into stuff all the time. I run into doors because they open the wrong way for left-handers. Uh, thank God for cellulars because when it was a real fall with a wire, I always tangle with a wire, it's a mess. Uh, anyway, I had these um, greater than signs backwards. <laughs> I had them backwards. So I was putting that kingdom was greater than domain and phylum was greater than kingdom and so forth. And the biggest one was species. The species was greater than everything else, which is backwards, right? Because species is the most exclusive category and the least inclusive. So to the left of species is a more inclusive category. One genus has several species. So the sign should go backwards. <laughs> okay. In other words, the more inclusive is domain. I just realized there's another way of looking at it, that actually there are more kingdoms than domains, more phyla than kingdoms. So anyway, I guess you can put this the other way around too. As long as we're clear that the species is the most exclusive category and least inclusive, and domain is the most inclusive and least exclusive. All right. I'm gonna leave it at that, otherwise I'm gonna get super confused. You can see here, for example, Ursus has many bears, okay? So that's the level of genus, has several different bears. But Ursus americanus is one of the species of the genus Ursus. You know the classification already, let me move forward to another, um, evidence for evolution, which is a structural homology. Homology. Or uh, later we're gonna talk about percentage homology, but homology has to do with a, a common origin of the structure, common origin, a different function, different function. So when we look at the forelimb of vertebrates, the forelimb is the forward arms, it's the forward of the forelegs, the ones that are forward, right? F-O-R-E is forward. Limbs, they are appendages that stick out from the trunk. So look at this, human, cat, whale, and bat. All are mammals, but the four limbs all have a common origin because they're forward. They come out from essentially from the, uh, the elbow, no, not the elbow, the, um, the shoulder but they have different function, totally different function, specific function. General function, yes, but specific function. Let's start with the bat, it's a wing, so it's for flying. And the whale is for swimming, the flipper, right? For terrestrial mammals, cats, it's for walking or running. And for humans, because we're bipedal, it's for grasping. So the fingers are, the articulation of the finger is actually useful, okay? The articulation is useful for grasping. Whereas in the others, the articulation is less useful. But what's interesting about whales is that even though it's a flipper, it's articulated internally. And that is what it, it is thought that whales, which are mammals, the ancestral whales were terrestrial. Otherwise, there would not be this articulation 
in the four flippers, the forward flippers of the whales and dolphins and sea mammals in general. Inside, those bones are articulated, which is not really needed for gliding, right? It could have been solid uh, a piece of bone here, a flap of bone. For the bat also, this is a super adaptation because the skin in between, the flap in between the fingers actually became webbed so as to produce a wing. Mm -hmm. So you notice these structures are called homologous because they have the same origin, but different function. Different would be an analogous structure. An analogous structure, for example, is the wing of a bat or the wing of a bird or the wing of an insect or of a butterfly. Those are analogous because they have the same function, but they have a different origin. So don't confuse analogous and homologous. Analogous has to do, homologous has to do with the same origin, but different function. Whereas analogous is different origin and same function. All right, another evidence, which is comparative embryology. Mm, let me see, when am I gonna take a break here? Uh, maybe this could be a good time for a break. Let me look at, uh... okay, well, let me stop here. Uh, let me do comparative embryology and then we'll take a break. We'll be kind of halfway on the, on the lecture. Let's look at comparative embryology. There's something called ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. It's a dictum, it's a saying, but it's not exactly true. I can tell you, when I was a teenager studying biology in high school in Mexico City, this was taught to us as a, uh, as a law of nature, of embryology, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Today, it has been disproved in general. So we can say only in the most general sense is this true, in a very general sense, but not specifically. And Meyer makes this point, okay? Let's go over it, it's a little subtle. Okay, first, ontogeny, we have to take the words apart here. What is, uh, these are compound words. Geni is a reference to genus or genesis or origin, right? Genesis, geni <clears throat> is uh, origin. Onto, is being the individual. So the origin of the individual, right? We're gonna cover next semester, the beginning of human life. <clears throat> the beginning, the origin of the individual recapitulates. It goes over, it goes over, it repeats. The origin of the individual repeats, recapitulates. Phylogeny is the origin of what? Of the entire phylum, of the entire group. That's what the phrase means. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. The origin of the individual retraces the steps of the origin of the entire group. In other words, the embryology, the embryonic stages <clears throat> of each individual in that phylum is reenacting or is going through the stages of the evolutionary stages of the phylum itself, of the entire group. Not really, it's a false dictum, strictly speaking, but only in very, very general broad terms in, in, in the big, big, big picture, is there some level of truth in it? So let's look at the level of truth. <clears throat> Here we have, first of all, look at the categories. Fish, salamander, tortoise, chick, pig, calf, rabbit, human. 
what's common to all these categories? What are they? Fish, <clears throat> amphibians, reptile, tortoise is a reptile, it's a turtle, salamander, is a yeah. amphibian. <clears throat> they're vertebrates, they're all vertebrates, right? Chick is a bird, and all these are mammals. So they're vertebrates. Okay, so they have in common, these are all vertebrate categories, but they're all different orders of the vertebrates or classes. Then it's tracing the embryonic development from early stage. The first row is the early stage. The middle row is a middle stage of embryonic development. And the third row at the bottom is the late stage of embryonic development. It is obvious by the designs. These are drawings. Mostly, it was one famous guy, I think he was a German Herschel that did this comparative embryology, looking actually at chick embryos and uh, calf embryos. Um, I don't think it looked at human embryos, but it could have been some uh, miscarriages that he was looking at, okay? Uh, he was looking also at um, fish and uh, amphibian embryos as they were growing, making their designs. He fudged a few things here and there to make them kind of similar. But we can see, in general, there's a development, obviously, from a more primitive state to a more advanced, more developed. We say that this occurs with cellular differentiation, which also gives rise to tissues, gives rise to organs and systems and so forth. So we see there is a development of the embryo from early to late. In fact, what's the very first stage of embryonic development? The very first stage, if we're talking about embryo, what kind of reproduction? Give you two choices, asexual or sexual. Perfect. Sexual. Sexual means biologically, biologically that there is fertilization, the process of fertilization. An egg needs to be fertilized by a sperm. So what's the very first stage of embryonic development? Fertilization, well, that's the process, but the actual structure is a fertilized egg, which by definition is no longer an egg because an egg is, is a gamete, right? Once it's fertilized, no longer a gamete, is the zygote. The zygote is a fertilized egg, which is diploid, et cetera. We'll get into that next semester. That's valid for any vertebrate. In fact, for any man, animal that reproduces sexually and even plants that reproduce sexually. Anyway, the first stage is a zygote. All zygotes look alike. They look like a little ball, just different sizes. A human zygote, we cannot see a human zygote, right? But we can see a cow zygote. A cow zygote is maybe 10 to 20 times bigger than a human zygote. So we can actually see, see a cow zygote, very tiny, <laughs> by, by simple sight, and it's a single cell. So we can see single cells with our eyes, very few of them. That's one example. So all zygotes of all different species look alike because it's a single cell, it's essentially a ball. It's a sphere. Mm -hmm. Internally, of course, there are different genomes which belong to different species. So let that zygote develop naturally. And what we'll end up with is the different species that have differentiated issues, organs, and systems differentiate into the different species. But you see there's some kind of similarity even in the late stages of all the mammals. So a pig about to be born looks somewhat similar to a calf, to a rabbit, and to a human who is about to be born, somewhat similar, somewhat similar. What is missing significantly of the human from the other mammals is a tail. But we have a tail bud. Humans develop first a tail bud during embryonic development early on. And then that tail bud gets reabsorbed and it becomes, excuse me, vestigial and it's called what? The tailbone, we don't know we have it. It's a coccyx, uh, scientifically, biologically. We don't know we have a tailbone until we fall on it. Then we know it because it breaks and it's very painful. And there's nothing you can do about it, just don't sit, walk around and so forth, but it will heal by itself. Just like ribs heal by themselves, you just gotta be patient. 
but the tail has been reabsorbed. But we have a tail early on, right? Which is an extension of the vertebral system. Some animals get to keep their tails and so forth. Another one is the gill slits, not actual gills, but gill slits. In other words, the, the openings on the side of the uh, <clears throat> neck that in fish and amphibians develop into gills, into functioning gills early on and in fish for the rest of their lives. In amphibians, they're in the juvenile stage. <clears throat> but then in uh, reptiles, birds, and mammals become part of the jaw system, the jaw. And also even imagine this super specialization, they become part of the inner ear and the bones inside the inner ear, right? <clears throat> and so there's a super adaptation that originates from the gill slits and even part of the throat and the vocal cord, those are all developments that happen later. For example, here I can show you, picture says a thousand words. Here are the gill slits of uh, fish and reptiles, and then birds and mammals. And look at this, this is an embryonic uh, development of those gill slits are even numbered one through six, where they end up different parts of the skull, the mandible, the ear bones, the eustachian tube, which goes from the inner ear, no, middle ear. On the other, on the inside of the uh, membrane, the panic membrane, eustachian tube is a little tube that goes all the way down to the throat for having equal pressure inside and outside of the eardrum, otherwise we break the eardrum. We explode it. And then even the cartilage around the box, the voice box, right? <clears throat> Whereas in fish, they become actual gills, which are very different from all these other structures that we have embedded in our skull and neck. But they all start as gill slits. I talked about the tail also, that in fish and reptile remain and in birds, but in uh, and even some other mammals, but in the human, it's reabsorbed. Uh, another one, since we're at it, is <clears throat> Organs that become rudimentary or sometimes known as vestigial, vestigial structures or sometimes vestigial functions, uh, rudimentary organs, for example, the appendix that uh, is a remnant of another bag that was in our gut. Uh, so people speculate that it had to do with rumination, with uh, chewing the cod for herbivores, like, like cattle. That was an extra chamber used for allowing that cod to ferment some more and get more nutrition out of it. We talked about the coccyx, it's uh, the reabsorbed tail. Look at this, pretty dramatic. In whales, a, a pelvic bone or pelvic girdle. Why would a whale need a pelvis? What is a pelvis used for? Hip. It's a hip, the hip bone, right? The hip is used for. Uh, stabilizing the structure in uh, terrestrial animals. On four-legged creatures, the hip is kind of horizontal and it connects the lower body to the upper body, especially the, the, uh, the vertebrates. For us, for humans in particular, bipedal, right? The hip is actually uh, makes the balance between the upper body and the lower body. And you can see that the spinal cord is anchored into the hip and then the legs come out from the under part of the hip. Anyway, it's definitely the hip structure is a uh, structure for terrestrial walking around. So whales don't need, dolphins the same. And you see mammal, they have these marine mammals, they have these uh, rudimentary pelvic bones that are vestigial, they don't have a, a function any longer. And that's a speculation that these uh, marine mammals used to be terrestrial, their ancestors used to be terrestrial. Sometimes these uh, vestigial structures develop a secondary uh, function. 
it's estimated some people are actually born without an appendix. They live fine. They don't even know it necessarily. All right. It kind of an advantage to not have an appendix because then you cannot get appendicitis, which uh, if it's not intervened quickly, can kill the person if it bursts, right? But a secondary characteristic that has come up of the appendix secondary function is that in some cases, it's associated with the immune system. It has to do something with the immune system. Uh, uh, I haven't read up on it, uh, but I think that um, it can stimulate somehow the immune system of, of the body. Oh, tonsils are another one that, yeah, uh, horizontal, right? They get embedded in there, not used, but they're, they're molars for our ancestors that were mostly herbivores. So they needed more molars, flat teeth for grinding and for, yeah, for uh, trying to break down cellulose as much as possible. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop there because the next one I believe is biogeography. Let me go to this here. Yeah, okay, so we talked about residual structures. The other one, biogeography and molecular evidence will leave for the second half, okay? It's 11.20. This could be a good time for a little break. So you see how comparative embryology comparing the different phyla the, let me just go back there to uh, recapitulate this uh, recapitulation. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, not really in the strict sense, because this implies, this dictum, this saying, implies that, for example, humans, because we have gill slits, we start as fish and then we go through the fish stage and then we go through the amphibian stage and then we go through the reptile phase and then eventually we end up in the mammal phase. That's nonsense because we don't change species or even group as we go through embryology, right? As we go through embryonic development, think about it, it's a conceptual thing, where we remain the same species from conception, from fertilization to death, we remain the same species. So we don't jump from species to species, but we do have more common characteristics in earlier embryonic development. We have more common characteristics with other species. But that same ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny implies that we actually change species. Let's say that the fish are more primitive, that we start out as fish and then re become re amphibians, reptiles, etc., until we finally land into the mammal stage toward the end of in late em embryonic development. That's not true. That's nonsense. It doesn't, it doesn't really happen. We remain the same species from fertilization to, uh, to death. Okay? And the same argument is for every other species. All right, so you see the truth and the falsity of this statement. And again, Meyer uh, talks about that at length. Questions or comments? Break. Okay, we're here. Next one's gonna be about geography, so we'll remain up a little earlier today. Mm. Okay, so let's uh, break here for a moment. I'm gonna pause the recording. I'm resuming recording. Now, I want to look briefly at the little outline for this lecture, which means I need to minimize this a little bit. Actually, make it smaller. I send that on Thursday, looking for the email that I sent. Thursday, here we go. I have a little summary here of Meyer's evolution Chapter two. Uh, I 
going to have to go through this with a roll. Let me just make it bigger. Right, so fossil record, the logical strata, radioactive clock, we talked about that, common ancestor, branching, evolution, morphological similarities. Oh yes, so the homology, I do want to mention this. The homology or percentage identity or similarity it be at four different levels, right? Or four different areas. It could be structural, meaning, for example, the arms, the forward limbs that we saw of uh, human, cat, bat, and whale, right? That's structural. I'm talking about homology here, structural homology, an actual an anatomical feature, or it could be physiological, meaning a pathway, for example, of metabolism, how we digest protein in common with other animals, etc. So it could be a physiological characteristic in contrast to anatomical, or it could be at the molecular level. This one is going to be really the more accurate one for building phylogenetic trees. And phylogenetic trees will be used for building the um, for establishing ancestry, common ancestry. And the molecular one is gonna be the most accurate one by comparing percentage homology of DNA or proteins of different species and how uh, closely or distantly they are related. And then behavioral, it can also be behavioral. For example, for carnivores, stalking the prey, etc. cetera. Okay. So, uh, it could be in any one of these four categories that the homology exists. Yeah. All right, so we talk about uh, embryology, recapitulation, vestigial structures. Now, here we are. Biogeography, and then the molecular evidence, which I keep saying is the strongest one, and you'll see why. So here is uh, an example of biogeography. Different parts of the world, different regions of the world give, uh, do what is known as geographical isolation, which is one of the most common ways that can lead to uh, speciation or uh, the development of new species. A very good example is the camelids, camelids, which are the family of camels, as the word says. And they exist today in different parts of the world, different continents that are isolated by entire oceans. All right, and now uh, we know that most animals actually know how to swim. The mammals in particular, they can swim very slowly generally, but they generally float. Why is that? Why do you think that most mammals can float generally? The lungs, we'll consider the lungs, right? And the lungs are kind of horizontal on a quadruped, on an animal that is on four legs. Typical mammals are on four legs. And so the lungs are like an internal balloon of air that allows the animal to tend to float. Even elephants, it's just fascinating to see their videos. You can go online and see videos of elephants swimming <laughs> through lakes or something like that. They're slow, but they, they basically move their legs and paddle forward. Mm. Anyway, so, but to get from Africa to South America, through the entire Atlantic Ocean, I don't think a camel can make that whole distance just by swimming the, the Atlantic, okay? It would be totally devastated by all kinds of currents and sharks and everything else. And the fact is that we find camelids today in several different parts of the world, and they're all related. So for example, the dromedary, 
it, I always get these two confused because I think the camel is the one with a single hump, but it turns out that the camel is actually with the one with the two humps. <laughs> Whereas the dromedary, the one with normally know as camel, right? Like the pyramids in Egypt and all that, it's single hump, but it's technically it's called a dromedary. The hump, by the way, is mostly fat, <laughs> which is an accumulation of, uh, of uh, tissue for desert living. <laughs> Africa, Northern Africa, and into Asia, uh, the Arab Arabian Peninsula, Arabic Peninsula. But then the actual camel is more into Asia. Those are connected by a continent also, but keep in mind in between here, what's in between Africa and the Arabic Peninsula or Arabia? Uh, yeah, the Red Sea is this little slice here, right? This is the Indian Ocean. But what is in between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean is the Suez Canal, which is totally developed and ships go through there and it's a very narrow point. And certainly uh, today you don't see camels and dromedaries uh, wandering back and forth through the Suez Canal, right? So that's very uh, tight there. It's a bottleneck. Uh, by the way, we'll see bottleneck uh, later in another part of one of the forces for, for driving evolution. Then we have North America used to have camels or dromedaries. I don't know which one, but uh, I think it was actually dromedaries. Uh, they were kind of uh, slow moving herbivores and they got hunted down to extinction. Mm -hmm. And then finally in South America, after going through North America, and what is known as Mesoamerica, which is Mexico, all of Central America, six countries in Central America, through the Panama, what is today the Panama Canal, which is actually an isthmus. And there is land there that goes all the way down into South America and the Andes, mm -hmm. uh, the whole mountain range of South America, we find uh, not only the Yama, but we also find three other different species of camelids, the guaraco, the alpaca, and the vicuña. <laughs> and they're all related to the camel. No humps there, but very similar uh, anatomy, as you can see. And uh, they all spit also, just like the camel. Actually, it's from the gut, so they regurgitate, and it's nasty. And it's one mechanism of defense that they have. So there's a behavioral uh, uh, example in addition to the structural uh, example. Mm -hmm. So different parts of the world have uh, allowed for speciation, but it's very obvious that all the camelids have a common ancestor, right? So this biogeography comes from a thing called continental drift and plate tectonics. Now we covered this in the environmental course. So Elizabeth, uh, you'll get to it when we get to the environmental course uh, for uh, your time. But basically is that you can think of continents on the top of on the surface of the earth as a, a part of the crust, really, that is solid, but they are like rafts. They are like rafts that are moving on top of a liquid, a molten liquid, thick liquid that is under the crust of the earth, which is the mantle. And the mantle now then comes out when there's a volcanic eruption. And that is what we call lava, which is red hot and is uh, thick, but it's liquid, it's molten. So it moves. So the continents really move or shifting on top of that. The drastic example of this earthquake that we had recently uh, in Syria, and Turkey is an example of that because it aligns, it's one of the sub features that come out from a tectonic plate that is in that region of the world in uh, Asia here, uh, between Europe and Asia proper. Turkey, as you know, is in between uh, Europe. It's got Greece on one side and it's got Syria on the other side. So, if we go back about 225 million years ago, right? Remember the earth itself has about four and a half billion years, but for the most part of that time, 
the earth uh, was still molten. There was very little crust. The crust started forming, uh, uh, cooling down enough to have solid this uh, continents. And there was a huge supercontinent that was called Pangaea. And Pan is a reference to all or every. And Gaia or Gaia, that's where we get the word geo, geos, which is Earth. So a Greek reference to Earth. Pangaea was all the continents together as a single, essentially a single landmass. Then that broke up into two main pieces. The northern part, which is known as Laurasia, and the southern Gondwana land, or Gondwana for short. And then that continued to sub-crack and subdivide into eventually the continents that we know today. It has taken about 225 million years to get to the seven continents that we have today. Uh, they have been moving away from each other. And there are places of uh, fracture and rubbing that is occurring, but there are also tectonic plates below the ocean, uh, below the surface of the ocean, that are rubbing against the continents that we see above uh, the ocean. And this is how we end up with these uh, huge land masses that we'll call continents. By the way, if you're counting here, two, four, six, eight, it comes to eight. That's because India is not really a continent, it's considered a subcontinent. So subcontinent because uh, it's smaller. Uh, in contrast, Australia, that is really totally surrounded by water, we would think of it as an island, but it's so large that it's actually considered a continent, right? Even though it's also an island, but it's totally surrounded by water. But India started down here, you see. And before that, it was part of Gowana land, which is this area here. And migrated from the Southern hemisphere, see the Southern, see the equator? Migrated from the Southern hemisphere northward and literally crashed into Asia and is still pushing Asia today from the South but it's already in the Northern Hemisphere because it went across the equator. And what is the mountain ridge that India has caused by pushing into Asia? The largest mountain ridge of the world, the Himalayas. And you can see, think of mountain ridges as corrugation of plates, tectonic plates coming together and pushing upward, all right? Drastic, of course, with the advantage of millions of years of development, uh, but that pushing sometimes creates tension, and when the tension breaks, then that causes a tremor or an earthquake, like the big one, I think it was around category or category eight, which is huge for, for uh, earthquakes. All right. So that's how we get these uh, different continents. But, you know, 225 million years ago, we had a lot of animals and plants on the world already, on this crust. So when these continents started taking off on their own, the animals and plants that were there stayed there and went their own way too. They went with the raft, they were on top of the raft. And that's how you can see that the coast of South America, the Eastern coast of South America, fits to fit into the Western coast of Africa because it came from there, <laughs> okay? And at this stage, when there were a single continent, essentially, the lines are placed there just for representation of where the future continents are going to come from. That single landmass, well, of course, the camelids were walking around all over the place. Some of them stayed in South American plate, others stayed in the African plate, and further developed. Mm -hmm. In addition to, well, in association with biogeography, with biogeography and looking at the continents as rafts, floating rafts essentially, is also the bioregions, right? The, the climatological regions that establish essentially the type of vegetation that is going to be there and also the seasonality of that vegetation. 
And therefore, what follows after the plants is going to be the animals, beginning with the herbivores first, and then the omnivores, and finally the carnivores that feed strictly on other animals. But the first consumers are always going to be uh, animals that eat plants. And the plants are conditioned by the type of weather or climate that is in the region. From the tropics, we can fan out. Another characteristic here that we cover in the environmental bioethics course, you see that the black horizontal line here represents the equator, right? Where is most of the land mass of the world? North or Southern hemisphere? By far, most of the land mass that today is exposed out of the oceans, right? Is in the Northern hemisphere by far. And it's mostly, it's all of Europe for sure, all of Asia. Uh, uh, well, I want to say most of the uh, vast majority of Asia because these islands, also these Polynesian islands that's considered Southeast Asia, right? That is a very tiny fraction of land mass compared to the big Asia uh, picture here. Most of Africa is actually in the Northern Hemisphere. We tend to think of, at least I tend to think of Africa as the Southern Hemisphere, but no, most of Africa is really in the Northern Hemisphere. Australia, definitely South. Most of South America is in the Southern Hemisphere, but all of Mesoamerica and North America, obviously, including Canada and the Arctic is in the Northern Hemisphere. So there's more land mass in the north and therefore more water mass in the south, including the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean is uh, kind of split here in the middle between Africa, India, and Australia, and Antarctica at the bottom. So you see it's about a dozen uh, regions, bioregions, and these regions are a combination of the climate that exists in those regions, and therefore the vegetation, and therefore the animals that are also going to live in these regions. Here are some example of fossils uh, of bioregion distribution of a single category of plants or a general group, which are the palms throughout all the different continents. So for example, these are fossils, some are fossils or some are edgings or diagrams, uh, sketches that are made based on the fossils. So these fossils are from South America, whereas uh, other fossils come from Africa or from Asia, right? See, these are all palms. Mm different drawings, there's a large variety of palms throughout the world. The general, the common characteristic of all palms throughout the world today is that they tend to live in what region? Tropical. Like cold, tropical and subtropical, right here. Okay, and you see even Florida is just the southern tip of Florida. Just yesterday I was talking with one of the undergrad students who's helping me in the forest a little bit. He's from Georgia. And she says, oh, uh, Professor, I know a fellow who spent thousands of dollars bringing palms into Georgia, into his lot. Into, he had some kind of acreage and did it in the summertime, right? And planted all this palm from other parts of the world, spent thousands of dollars in it, looked beautiful for the summer. And then the winter came and they all froze. <laughs> The palms don't tolerate much degree of cold, all right? Certainly not the cold snaps or snow or anything like that. And that's why I keep pointing out that in our forest is very unique because we have pines and palms together. Whenever you see a pine and a palm growing together naturally, I say that's a reason for pause and consider what's happening. I say naturally, not that they were planted by humans, but pine and palm growing together is strange. It doesn't happen in many parts of the world because in a subtropical region, so that kind of scenario typically needs to occur in what kind of uh, climate? 
pine and palm together, naturally. What kind of climate? Tropical, subtropical, along the equator, north and south of the equator, pretty much was painted in the bright green, right? Which should be tropical uh, rainforest. So that's where we get pine and palm together, this region here, or grassland if it's in the African savanna or something like that. Uh, but the pine is still, it's a conifer, right? Pine is adapted to, where do we expect pines? Naturally. Warm or cold? Cold, right? Up north in Canada, in Siberia. In fact, the taiga is a coniferous forest, a forest of pine trees, vast regions of Canada, what is known as the Northern Territories, not inhabited because it's so cold. There's then eventually you get into the permafrost. You can't even have trees growing there because it's, uh, the ground is frozen. But the uh, the uh, the pines, the coniferous forests, are up north. Pine tree is adapted for cold uh, weather, drastic uh, cold weather. So we see a pine and a palm together. One of those two had to adapt. And which one was it? The pine. The pine adapted to the warm tropical, subtropical environment. Going to our forest for a minute, I want to point out that we have pine and palm together. We have the slash pine, which is the only species that has survived down here in South Florida. And then we have the sable palm. I say, if you look at the official seal of the state of Florida, you see a sable palm in the middle. So it's the official palm of the state, right? The one that adapted, of course, is the pine. And when did they do that? During the last ice age, the recession of the last ice age was about 10 to 12,000 years ago. The bottom line, the pines that we have here on campus and the, whatever is left in the South Florida have been here for the past 10,000 years. Not those individuals that we see outside the window but their ancestors, <laughs> okay, 10,000 years until the soul got here about a century ago. <laughs> and the whole peninsula was covered by slash pine um, until about the 1900s when the modern colonizers from New England area brought down the railroad, Henry Flagler, and with that came the metals. And the two-man saw, the white blade saw, that came from up north uh, in relatively large amounts to be sold in the general goods stores. Uh, why you've seen them on movies of the West. <laughs> One man gets on one side of the, oh, come on, give me the old stuff. <laughs> this is all modern. It's good. How about antique? How about two men saw? <laughs> I guess at that time, women could also cut trees, but it's mostly men. <laughs> That's the two men saw, okay? White blade. One guy gets on one side of the tree, the other one gets on the other side of the tree, and they start sawing away until the tree comes down. So that's what's done with all the pine trees that were in South Florida, the slash pine. They actually make good construction material because uh, inside pine trees have resin instead of sap, right? And uh, the resin is oily, uh, amber color, uh, sticky and thick and so it's resistant to termites and boring beetles and all that because they get their jaws gummed up with a resin. <laughs> so they make good construction material. To this day, pine floor houses, yeah, the old houses in Florida, you know, you have a pine floor, it's very precious. Uh, anyway, pines were cut down and uh, whole towns were developed throughout South Florida. Along the shortest now, today we have only about 1% left of the original uh, slash pine in the count in the in South Florida. And we here in St. Thomas have the large, the last remaining highland pine forest left in Day County in slash pine, which is also known as Day County Count, Day Piney, Day County Pine. So we try to preserve it by all means possible. Okay. Anyway, um, 
that's with regards to biogeography. Plants can tell us a lot about the climate of the area because it's long-term and how the, the weather transitions eventually on long-term into climate. So we have an example of palms that have been found throughout the world. And some of these fossils have been found also up north, which means that the earth has gone through cycles of warmth and cold. The cold, the ice ages we call winterization. And then the warm times at the opposite end of the climate, we call tropicalization all the way up to Alaska and Northern territories where we find tropical species, tropical fossils uh, up uh, North in uh, Alaska, Canada, Siberia, what is today cold, meaning that at one point, those were tropical regions. Those are the natural cycles of uh, climate on earth. All right, let's get into the uh, molecular thing, which is, um, I've been saying it's the most accurate one because this one is actually based on um, numbers and the percentage homology goes down to the molecular level. And the big macromolecules that are used typically is either the DNA genome or the uh, protein, the proteome, the sequence. And you know that the sequence of uh, proteins comes from the DNA, but there's a slight uh, difference there, right? Because first of all, not all genes are expressed into proteins, number one. So the genotype is one and the phenotype, protein can be considered like the first level of phenotype, first level of expression. Uh, may vary a little bit. That's number one. So in other words, not all genes are expressed into proteins all the time. Secondly, there are alternative uh, readings of the DNA that can give alternative sequences of proteins, similar but not identical. And therefore the proteome is not really identical to the genome, right? But they can be used as long as we stay within the same category. What I'm trying to say by all this is that we can do molecular homology, either comparing the genomes of different species or comparing the proteome of different species. What we should not do is jump from one system to the other. For example, comparing the genome of humans to the proteome of chimpanzees. That's gonna give us bad results, right? The homology is not gonna be, what do you expect the homology to be? Better or worse? than if we stay within the same system, genome to genome or protein to protein. It will stay within the same system, all right? And of the two, protein or genome, the genome itself is going to be the best homology, but it's genotype. Again, not all the genotype expresses, right? All right, so let's look at percentage. Now here, after saying, having said all that, what is what system homology is this one? What are they comparing? Percent of amino acids. And where are the amino acids? In DNA or proteins? Proteins. So this is a proteinomic <laughs> homology. It's not a DNA homology, right? So it's not gonna be as accurate if we were to do it on the genome. The percentages would be a little more accurate, but maybe by fractions of percentage, not full numbers. Maybe full integers, I don't know. But uh, look at this. The human with the rhesus monkey. Now these are all contemporary animals. That's another point that I wanna make, that there are no contemporary ancestors Therefore, oh, where's my pad? <laughs> Where is it? Hello? Okay. Make it bigger. Yes. Right. There are no contemporary ancestors. Let me see if I can do this. Push it over. Oh. Uh, bigger. No, I can't see it. 
All right. I hope you can see that. Oh, here we go. Oh. All right, no contemporary ancestors. What do I mean by that? By definition, ancestors are from before. They're not around today. For example, what are our most recent ancestors? Our most recent ancestor is the previous generation. It's our parents. And before them, our grandparents. And before them, and you see this a branching, right? Of individuals. Uh, before our grandparents, our great-grandparents, and so forth and so forth, we can keep going back, back, back until we find actual common ancestors, okay? Between different families or people living even in different continents, if we go far enough, we'll find eventually common ancestors of all humans both on the male and the female line. But by definition, ancestors come before us, so they're not contemporary. We just need to go back two generations. And it's very rare to see great-grandparents or even great-great-grandparents still living, right? Typically, they're already dead, so they're not contemporary. Well, the same argument we can use by analogy with other uh, species. The rhesus monkey is alive today. The chimpanzee is alive today. So it is nonsense to say that we evolved from the chimpanzee or that the chimpanzee evolved from us because we're contemporary and we cannot have contemporary ancestors, okay? But we do have common ancestors. In other words, we have an ancestor, we have a creature, an animal, a vertebrate, a mammal, that looked somewhat like a monkey, somewhat like a human, but was neither monkey nor human, was another animal, was another species that lived millions of years ago. And that's the argument here. So the percentage homology doesn't make sense without common ancestors. Why do we have common homology? If each species was created individually, why would there be homology between them? We would not expect because each is an individual creation, right? Remember the scala natura where there's no movement between the rungs? And so percentage homology is pointing toward a common ancestor. And the greater the percentage of homology, then the nearer that ancestor is to both groups. So for example, our common ancestor with a monkey is closer to our common ancestor with a mouse. Well, we also have a common ancestor with a mouth, with a mouse, which is basically going to be a mammal, a common mammal from which all mammals derive. We can make a similar argument with the birds and with amphibians and with the lamprey, which is a type of fish, all right? I mean, we even have common ancestry with a fly, which is amazing, but true. For example, when we look at these Hox genes, the Hox gene is a homeo box. Let me explain that for a moment. Hox is a contraction for homeotic box, all right? And the homeotic box <laughs> is basically the body plan, is the basic body plan. Where do the different parts of the basic body plan come from? For example, when we look at the human and when we look at all mammals, we have a trunk, and then we have appendages. So the basic body plant is a trunk with four appendages coming out like at the four corners. All right, that's the basic body plan. You have to think in very general terms. The basic body plants for most um, insects and arthropods are head, thorax, and abdomen. Head, thorax, and abdomen, uh, et cetera. The basic body plants for birds, for example, is that the wings are in the forearms, and the lower appendages are for walking around and grasping the twigs, et cetera, right? So that's the homeotic box is the basic body plan. And because that is more common between different groups of uh, animals, then we can see percentage homology there. And look at the percentage homology here with regards now, this is DNA. DNA is, uh, here are uh, tetrapod vertebrates. At the bottom, I'm starting from the bottom up. 
because there's more percentage homology down here at the bottom of the graph. Let's see if I can make it a little bigger. Yes, I can. A little higher. Uh, okay, I'm down here on the lower right. These are tetrapod vertebrates. What are the what are tetrapods? Pod is a reference to foot or appendage, just like a podium is a leg, right? Tetra four. So these are four-legged creatures, four-legged vertebrates, which means that they are the amphibians, frogs, reptiles, birds, mammals. What is missing from this group? What group is missing here from the tetrapods, from the vertebrates, which are not tetrapods? They don't have four legs. Therefore, they swim around yeah. fish, <laughs> okay? Okay, so you can see amphibious, reptile, birds, mammals. And look at the percentage homology. Mm -hmm. These are sequences from the homeobox genes the ones that establish the basic body plan, which is kind of long. Then going up, a cephalochordates, these things are called lancelets. They exist today. They're kind of primitive fish-like uh, creatures. Their gills are exposed at the front end. And then they have a wiggly body, long, elongated. There is a good percentage homology there also from that basic body plan. Even with starfish, echinoderms, with sea urchins, look at the percentage homology. It's amazing because they are what we call deuterostomes. It has to do with early embryonic development precisely. That matches quite a bit. Look at the percentage homology. It's amazing, pretty strong. Mollusks, mollusks are snails, squids, octopods, uh, lugs, right? Shells. Seashells, those are all mollusks, pretty strong also. Now we're getting into arthropods, little less. What is missing here is the upper part here, the more sophisticated part of the homeobox is beginning to run out. Finally, we'll get to ground worms. We even have homology with worms, with round worms, not annelids like, uh, like the actual earthworm, but these are, most of these are parasites. So pretty strong. Uh, comparing a fly, this in this case is the fruit fly, Drosophila megalogaster, the one that is used in the labs all the time, right? The fruit fly with the baby. Look at the percentage homology on the basic body plan by color, the, the regions that coincide. Okay, these are. Uh, exons shown on uh, genes, in other words, the coding region of uh, genes. The basic plan, head, thorax, abdomen matches up with the anterior and the posterior of mammals. Another diagram, this one can be, this is comparative. So we can do, here's where we can go from percentage homology to a cladogram. So the cladogram, what will we do? We start with the most recent ones. In other words, the ones that have the highest percentage homology, we would put closer to each other. For example, see the percentage homology between cow and pig. These are the bases, right? The nucleotides, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, ATCG, ATCG, right? Okay, look at the percentage homology here between Cow and pig on this particular region, whatever it is, uh, on the on the genome, pretty much identical here. Identical. So here's a difference. It's a T for G, A for C. Then uh, another difference here, A C. Then the homology picks up again. Here's another distinction, C T and CG, all right? So we can add up, we can just add the number of nucleotides that match and make a percentage out of it, like 90% or something like that. So that's the closest match. We can see by the eye that's the closest match. So that means that cow pig has to be closer together. 
Then we look cat and dog. Again, we see a homology here, but not much homology between cat and dog and cow and pig. So they have to be further out. In other words, there's more homology between a dog and a cat than between a dog and a cow. You can make the same argument be between all four animals. So on. Let's look at the human and the chimp because the chimp is about 99% homologous with the human, the DNA, the genome, the human, the, the uh, chimp genome is about 99% homologous to the human genome. It's amazing. Only 1% difference, but it's scattered around. That difference makes a big difference. <laughs> so let's look at chimp and human. A, G, A, G, G, C, A equal. Okay, here's one difference. C, G, D, G, G, T, D, G, T, C, C. Here's another difference. That's two, A, G. C, G, A, C, G, G, C, C, A, T, C, same, 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 same. Okay, here's another one, three, G, A, uh, et cetera. And the same is, so only three out of all these, maybe there are 50 letters here, 40 letters, I don't know, but only three are different, right? When we extrapolate that, that should match up to about 1% difference <laughs> between the human and the chimp. Then, we look at uh, lemurs, which are further out from the human and the chimp. There's less uh, homology, so they have to be further out on the branch. And between these three primates, these are primates or monkey-like creatures, uh, a bird will be much further out because all the other six or seven animals are mammals, right? So for comparison, this is kind of the control <laughs> of the experiment. You see for comparison with the bird, there's much less homology than with all the other six categories. So the bird has to be necessarily way out here. But there will be a, a there will be a, uh, an, a common ancestor between birds and mammals, because we share many commonalities with the bird and the mammal. We're tetrapods, we're vertebrates, etc. Okay, so all those genes have to be homologous uh, somehow. All right, that's uh, how the percentage homology is figured out. And you can see it's down to the molecular level because it's a nucleotide or the base pairs. Mm. When it's done between different species, here's a more sophisticated diagram. Mm. The monkeys in general, including primates and humans, they're known as anthropoidea. Anthropos is human-like. It's a reference to human-like or similar to. These are different categories. And you can see the percentage homology there. What can also uh, be gleaned from here from the sequence is what is known as molecular clock because it turns out that mutations occur by chance, but they occur on a more or less regular basis over long periods of time. And they accumulate, mutations accumulate in the genome Keep in mind that most of the genome is uh, what used to be called junk DNA. In other words, it doesn't code, it's non-coding. Uh, the human genome, what percentage of the human genome actually codes for genes? Anybody know? It's a very small percent. It's only about 3% of the entire genome of the 3 uh, billion base pairs that we have. Only 3% are uh, coding region that code for an actual protein. So we can say that 97% of, of our genome, of our DNA sequence, is what is known as junk sequence, junking quotations, because it doesn't code for any particular protein or amino acid. 
or or polypeptide. Are you saying but that there's no? I mean, you're no gene. Mm -hmm. You're going to find the adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine all the way across. The exactly. Body, but it's but it's going to be some of it's going to be junk. Na nonsense. Nonsense I meaning it doesn't. It doesn't code for any amino acid. You know, it doesn't code for tRNA to form the protein. You know how it's a triplet code, the, the DNA code. Um, so, so the exon is a coding region, and intron is in between non coding. Uh, genetic code. And there is a, a diagram that looks like this, right? You can see these are uh, the four bases, but it's this is actually this has been translated into RNA or transcribed into RNA because it's U uracil instead of thymine. So here we have cytosine, adenine, and guanine, right? And also uracil, cytosine, adenine, and guanine. Uh, keep in mind again that uracil is substituting for thymine. Therefore, this is strictly speaking RNA, not DNA. But then you see there are triplets, right? UUU, UUC, UUA, UUG. On the DNA, this would be TTT, TTC, TTA, TTG, et cetera. Whatever you find a U, you would put a um, you would put a T for the DNA equivalent. So this is transcription going from DNA to RNA. And then it's got associated the amino acid that cor corresponds to that triplet. Because remember, it's a triplet code, all right? In other words, three, uh, it's what is called a codon. Three bases in sequence code for one amino acid. Three bases for one amino acid. And those three bases next to each other is a triplet, and it's also called a codon. C-O-D-O-N, a codon, right? For one amino acid. So for example, find that one is that is uh, single. The one that is single is this one, A-U-G. A-U-G, is that a triplet? Yes, is that a codon? Yes, is this DNA or RNA? A-U-G. U, uracil, RNA. What's the DNA equivalent? Right, so it will be ATG, but actually it's the complement, right? So the actual DNA complement of this, AUG would be T A C is the complement. All right, that's the DNA complement, but we can figure it out because it's ATCG, I say, a, T are in capitals, are the straight letters, A and T, or C, G are the curved letters. They're the complements. All right. Now, this AUG codon holds for MET, which is an amino acid, it's methionine. methionine. This is a three-letter abbreviation of all the amino acids. There are 20 amino acids in nature, okay? Phenylalanine, leucine, uh, Isoleucine, valine, methine, alanine, thyrosine, proline, histamine, histine, glycine, arginine, etc. There are 20. So they code, the codons code for a particular amino acid, but when we do the math, four times four in triplets, we get a total of 64 possible combinations, right? because it's four to the third power. Four times four is 16, times four is 64. So when we do triplets of four letters, four combinations, we get a total possibility of 64 triplets, but there are only 20 amino acids. And therefore there is duplicates. Two or more um, codons can code for the same amino acid. And here's an example, UUU or UUC code for phenylalanine. And it's grouped like that. Sometimes it's a single like methionine, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's all four. For example, serine, serine could be all four combinations of triplets. 
When you start examining this in a little more detail, what you notice is that the one that varies is the third base on the triplet. It's the third base. For example, UUU and UUC calls for phenylalanine. Look at serine. UCU, UCC, UCA, UCG. It's got the third base has changed. This is called wobble. The third base wobbles, but the other two bases stay the same, right? So there's redundancy. All four codons or all four triplets code for serine. Hmm? So it means that the third base can be substituted in some of them, but not all, many. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you notice that of all of them, the one that has a single coding, a single codon is methionine, and it's put in red because this is also known as the start codon. In other words, when the ribosome machinery is going through the RNA, the messenger RNA, the mRNA, the ribosome machinery is going through the mRNA and it finds an AUG, automatically it attaches a methionine. So that's the start codon. That's the beginning of the exon. That's the beginning of the coding regions. So every protein, every, every polypeptide, before being clipped, every polypeptide begins with a methionine. <laughs> huh? And then there are three stop codons. When does the machinery disassemble and fall off, the ribosome subunits, they fall off when they hit either UAA, UAG, or UGA. When they hit that codon at the end, the machinery falls off because that's a stop codon. And that's the end of the exon, <laughs> all right? Then there's an intron region, nonsense, non-coding, and eventually there's gonna be an AUG which begins the next polypeptide, right? So it's very elegant. It's mathematical, it's chemical, it's physical, and it works. <laughs> and it's universal. That's why we say that the, the DNA is the universal uh, molecule of inheritance. And we can also say that it's a universal molecule of metabolism because it begins the metabolic process by generating the necessary proteins, enzymes, for doing metabolism. Mm -hmm. That's why we also say that DNA must have established early on in life, in organic life, to be so universal. Mm -hmm. Even so, it's not really considered the very early, early one. It's considered to be, there's a precursor to DNA, evolutionarily speaking, which is going to be RNA, RNA. We'll get into that detail uh, later, but basically it's considered that RNA is a precursor of the DNA molecule. So back to the molecular clock. Molecular clock is simply the mutations that happen along the DNA molecule, mostly in the junk region. So there, most mutations are neutral. That's why we say most mutations don't affect the, the DNA. Well, they, they cause a mutation, but they don't necessarily fall on an exon. They would have to fall on an exon to disrupt the coding region. When they do fall on an exon, typically they're damaging, they're harmful. That could be the precursor for the cancer thing. And sometimes those, that uh, mutation can actually be beneficial and actually make the protein fold in a different way that is more efficient and stuff like that, seldom. But the point is that most mutations, because most of the DNA is junk, 97%, chances are that the mutation fall in a non-coding region and therefore it's, um, it's uneventful. It doesn't do any damage, it's neutral. Anyway, those mutations can be measured by doing the percentage homology of individuals within the same species. So when we compare the genomes of the three of us, if we have our DNA sequence, it's, it's my particular fingerprinting DNA, right? So if we compare the three, our three uh, genomes, we're gonna find fingerprinting, molecular DNA fingerprinting differences between us, uh, typically they call SNPs, SMPs, single nucleotide uh, uh, sequences that are variants 
still human genome and everything else, but they're, they're at the level of single nucleotide differences. So we can do a percentage homology within the species and figure out uh, the mutation rate. The background mutation rate is, I think it's about one for every 10,000 years or something like that, one mutation for every 10,000 years on the, on the genome. It can be plotted as you can see here, and we can establish a ratio because it's pretty linear. See the curve down here, the slope is linear. of the mutation rate, it's nuclear substitution. So if it's linear, then we can uh, uh, apply a formula to it. When then we can compare the DNA or the protein sequence of that DNA between species and see if it's above or below the background mutation rate and figure out how fast that evolution has taken place. Because we can use the mutation rate that one in 10,000 as an average ratio, as a background. Mm -hmm. If it's faster than that or slower than that between these two particular species, then we can use that also to put a, a time on it, known as a molecular clock. The big picture here that is what is known as an approximately constant rate of evolution, approximately rate because it does describe a linear function. So a linear function means that it's uh, fairly stable. It's not logarithmic, for example, or, or even more power uh, law or anything like that. It follows a linear uh, function which um, points toward a fairly constant mutation rate or of evolution through time. So this scale, by the way, the x-axis, which typically is the independent variable, right, is in millions of years. Mm -hmm. So to get a grip of the scale, the, the geologic time or evolutionary time. Mm. Yes, but within here, there is going to be some fluctuation. So maybe in the big picture of millions or hundreds of millions of years or even billions of years, we can talk about a constant mutation evolution rate. But when we start zeroing in into smaller time frames or geographical regions, we're going to find uh, something called generally the pattern that is called punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium, which is that when there's a mass extinction, if we begin with a mass extinction, for example, the satellite, the, the, the asteroid that fell into the Earth about 65 million years ago, more or less, and wiped out the dinosaurs. We'll talk about that more later in detail. There's a mass extinction. Then after that, niches open up for new species to evolve. So typically after a mass extinction, there will be what is known as an expansive radiation. We see that with time, a, a new species evolve simply because there are niches available that were not available before because the dinosaurs were eating everything in sight. And that's the classical one. So we have this cycle of mass extinctions and expansive radiations and so forth. And so far, there have been about five of those mass extinctions that we can figure out in geologic time for the Earth. That's why today we talk about the sixth mass extinction that may be anthropogenic caused by the human mostly because of changes in the climate or the loss of biodiversity, which is more urgent actually, loss of biodiversity, loss of geographical region for species to live. I hope it's making sense. I'm, I hope I'm not using terms that are too, too technical. Stop me along the way if you find that some of it is too technical, okay? Mm, I only have a couple of slides, about three more slides to go. So using the molecular clock, we can come up with these kinds of cladograms. And you can see in general, they go from the more primitive, like E. coli, bacteria, all the way to the primates, which are the most sophisticated complex animals uh, that we have today, at least by way of uh, intellect and brain capacity and so forth. Hmm? 
and all the other animals that we would suspect fall in between do fall in between by doing the molecular clock. Here's the main trunk and the branches coming out over millions of years and the average percentage change in DNA is down here. Okay. From the most change, of course, with E. coli to the least change among the different primates, including the human. So another big picture, by doing these cladograms, we can come up with a very sophisticated tree of life that has three main domains, the three domains, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya, eukaryotes. If we start with the eukaryotes, which are by far the most complex ones, and the eukaryotes is typically where we find the animals, plants, and fungi, the things that we see at plain sight, right? Meaning true nuclei, eukaryote, uh, karyo from the Greek nucleus, eu, true or real, in other words, the DNA is enclosed within a membrane, the nuclear membrane, and it's within the cell itself. So there's a double protection for the DNA. There's a protection of the cellular membrane, and there's a protection of the nuclear membrane. And the, generally, the DNA doesn't leave the nucleus. It sends out messages with the messenger RNA, right, for synthesis of proteins in the cytoplasm. Those are eukaryotes, this whole domain. So the non-eukaryotes are the prokaryotes, the ones that don't have an organized, organisms that don't have an organized nucleus, and those are going to be bacteria and archaea. And bacteria and archaea are very, very similar. The difference is, uh, structurally, the difference is only in their cell wall that the archaea are missing a layer in between the cell wall, in between the sandwich of the cell wall, Bacteria have a peptidoglycan uh, layer there, and the archaea are missing that layer. And that's why it's thought that bacteria develop for, are more recent, are not as primitive as the archaea, because the archaea are missing just a layer in their cell wall. But for the rest, they do have DNA, but it's not enclosed in a nucleus. It's just a glob that is not protected by a nuclear membrane. And that makes them prokaryotes. They don't have a true nucleus. All right, so these are the three main domains and the reclassification. For example, you see the whole diagram. Most of these diagrams, here are the plants, okay, branching out. These uh, rhizaria and ovulates and heteroconts hetero are mostly mm, Things that used to be classified as protozoans, protozoans, which are microscopic organisms, microorganisms. Remember the amoeba, the euglena, the paramecium, all those guys that used to wiggle around under the microscope. Now they are reclassified into these large categories, branching away, mostly microscopic. And look at the, the animals. These are the animals here. Okay, what we know as animals is just this little branch here. Mm -hmm. And the fungi, all the fungi are this little branch here. And all the plants, they have much more branching here because they're older. Uh, but that includes the algae. Most of them are algae. Actually, these are land plants. These are red algae, green algae, blue-green algae, etc., or uh, brown. Mm -hmm. So it's a reclassification, much more sophisticated, based on percentage homology. The root, we don't know, <laughs> which is the what is known as the, the last common ancestor or the earliest common ancestor, LCA, LCA, the last or least common ancestor, which would be up here, the first living organism from which all life evolved eventually in about 4 billion years is the approximate time. Very sophisticated, so we stick for now, for the purpose of our bioethics, we stick with a simplified diagram, which is this. The three domains are there. And uh, we break it down into five kingdoms, uh, which uh, the first two kingdoms actually are belong to the first two domains, 
which are the prokaryotes and the archaea bacteria and cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria, when I was studying this in high school biology in Mexico City, the cyanobacteria were classified as blue-green algae. But now we know they're not algae at all. They're actually bacteria, but they do have chloroplasts like chloroplasts like um, um, pigments inside, so they photosynthesize. And that's why they have a blue-green color, which is a cyan color, is blue-green. That's why they're called cyanobacteria. They photosynthesize and they are bacteria. And they are responsible for transforming the primitive atmosphere into something breathable because basically by photosynthesizing, not only were they generating oxygen as a byproduct, they were also absorbing CO2, which was in the primitive atmosphere, a much greater amount and very warm tropical earth. So basically they cooled the earth down, they provided oxygen and so that other organisms may come into existence by cellular respiration. <laughs> it's just amazing. One group of bacteria, cyanobacteria, imagine the abundance, the overabundance of these bacteria throughout the whole world to literally change the composition of the atmosphere significantly to a benevolent atmosphere that we can breathe today. All right. Then the eukarya, as I mentioned, they have a true nucleus, meaning that the nuclear membrane encloses the DNA for protection. And they are this grab bag of protists, which are just microscopic organisms. And then the fungi, the plants, and the animals that we know. Here are some illustrations of them. And uh, the bacteria and the archaea are here. And then these are the protists, not a real kingdom as such, but uh, it includes these microscopic organisms and some of the algae. And then Fungi, which includes not only mushrooms, but it's also um, yeast and molds are also part of the fungi. Plants, animals, and that's it. So we see that overall then there's plenty of evidence on earth that can be measured pointing toward the process of evolution of common ancestry, right? So that descent with modification, that's precisely what it, it means, descent from ancestors to the contemporary species with modifications. Another word of saying that is what we say speciation. Okay, we'll continue along these lines. Uh, let me see, there's one Saturday that I will not be here. Well, Next Saturday, there's no class because we have the conference. You're welcome to come to the conference. That's the undergraduate research conference that we have it. About 800 students from all over the US, undergrads are coming. We have dozens and dozens of posters that are gonna be presented. We have workshops also. It starts Friday evening and then Saturday all day. So you're welcome to come and check it out, but there's no class. And then the following, Saturday, yes, February 25. Okay, February 25, in two Saturdays. Uh, there will be no class here. I will post a video from the previous uh, it's lecture number four because I have prison ministry last minute. Uh, they need me, so I have to be available for that. Therefore, I will post a video and I'll send you the PowerPoint and all that so you can review it. And if you still need to do a summary, then you can base it on that, right? That will be in two Saturdays. So no in-person meeting. Correct. Again. All the following. And then I'm just looking at my calendar here. Actually, the third weekend from now, the third Saturday, which is March 4, I have the lecture with the other group with healthcare bioethics. It's on transplants. You're welcome to participate if you want. Uh, uh, but that's a course that will come up later. Healthcare bioethics will be in the fall. All right, I'm giving that lecture live here. You're welcome to assist if you want, but you're not obligated because we'll cover that within the course in the fall of healthcare bioethics, uh, bioethics of uh, human transplants. So we'll meet again next on March 11th, which is after the spring break. So the spring break ends on the 10th, and therefore we actually have class on March 11th. 
That will be the next in-person class. But it will be class number five because four is going to be virtual. All right. But in person will be March 11. That's a lot of, that's next month. <laughs> but in between there is going to be one lecture that I'm going to send you virtually for you to review. And what day will that be? I'll post it uh, soon. I don't have to wait until March 14th for, uh, until February 25 to post it. I'll, I'll send it uh, fairly soon. Okay. Within, I can send it within next week already, so you don't have to wait. Yes, sir. All right. Mm -hmm. Let me send it after Wednesday so that people don't get confused with summaries and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Well, thank you once again for being here. Let me close the video. Oh, any questions or comments before? Yep. Yeah. Fridays, I'll be able to talk to my talk. Yep. Okay, uh, give me a minute just to shut down here so we can close the video.